All right, welcome to the State of DeFi Security. In case we have not met, my name is Peter, and um, my full-time job is I'm a blockchain threat researcher at Coinbase, and I'm also an editor of a weekly newsletter called Blockchain Threat Intelligence, where every week I look at all the major compromises, who gets hacked, what is the root cause, what is the research, latest research that we can learn from, and tools that we can make our practices safer. So we have a lot to cover today. So we have, uh, we're going to talk about the economics of traditional security versus blockchain security. We have the threat model exercise that we're going to go through. And we will talk through code security as well as the incident response practices that we currently use in the industry. OK, let's, let's first talk about the economics of traditional security versus DeFi security. Why is it that the bad actors are so interested in our field that more and more of them are coming to attack us? Well, if you look at the traditional security and what are the bad guys are really trying to do is, for the most part, they're trying to steal data. They're stealing data. So there were about 1,000 incidents last year. And the most they could steal was around 400, like half a billion dollars with about $2 million per incident that they could profit. And the reason, like those profits are really coming from ransomware attacks, because when you steal all those emails and social security, you still have to monetize them. You have to go on secondary markets and try to sell it. That is not the case with the blockchain security, where we have about 300 incidents last year but almost $4 billion of actual assets were stolen. So that's six times as much profitability for attackers relative to traditional security field. So that means nation states, uh, financial actors, they understand this mathematics and they understand that if they want to make profit, cryptocurrency ecosystem is the way to go. That is why more and more of them are targeting us. Um, raise of hands, how many of you are doing threat model exercises when you're building a protocol or evaluating protocol? There are a few, few hands, all of you should be doing this. Like you should really, before you build a protocol, you should create this diagram, and, and I'll show you what it is in a second, thinking about like all the different ways that someone can target you. So do a, a very basic exercise, like what a generic DeFi threat model looks like, and then we'll see how the bad guys are actually exploiting it. So we have to start with users. So basically, you and I, we're interacting with protocols. For the most part, we are talking to dApps. So these are traditional Web2 applications. So your threat model there is we're dealing with Web2 infrastructure, with routing protocols, which are attacked every which way. And then we have wallet software. Once again, we've been, we have Atomic Wallet, 100 million stolen. So you have to think about those threats as well. And then we have, of course, the underlying blockchain technology. And the focus of this talk will be on smart contracts that are running on top of blockchains and administrators that are managing them. So here's how attackers are actually targeting this. So the last, so, so far uh, this year, so this is up to this week, the majority of compromises involved smart contracts. So we have $400 million that were stolen in the smart contracts space, and then another 140 million based on just administrative issues. So basically someone stealing private keys. What we are seeing though, and unfortunately we don't have time to talk about it, are all the issues on the user side. So we have $100 million stolen from users, and this is all involving like crazy drainer attacks and phishing and transaction, zero transfer issues, and uh, the wallet software leaking your mnemonic phrases. So for some reason, this is becoming more and more of an issue. We can't really dive into this for now, but uh, this is becoming a concern. But let's talk more about the right side of this threat model. So the way you should think about security is prevention. So code security is prevention, followed by detection, and then when all else fails, responding to it. So let's start with preventing things. Let's look at the code security. So this, I would take a picture of this. This is a list of attack vectors that I've observed so far this year, um, prioritized by risk. So these are the methods used to break things. Uh, risk is a function of not only the value that was stolen, but also the chance, the likelihood, of the occurrence of those issues. So the concerning part here is that the price oracle manipulation and reward manipulation consistently stay in the top left corner. 
year after year, quarter after quarter, we're seeing those are the main ways that attackers compromise us. Uh, examples of price oracle manipulation, how many of you are familiar with that? Okay, so everyone is on top of it. So someone, you're relying on a price data. If your protocol has that, you have to be extremely careful about how you extract that data and see if it's not manipulated. Uh, reward manipulation is more tricky. So think of Euler compromise where uh, someone was able to trick the protocol to give up a larger liquidation reward than was expected. Stolen private keys is more of a process issue. So uh, I think developers think a lot about code security. They go through multiple audits and they feel safe at that point. But you still have to think about operational security. So where do you sto store your private keys? Well, how large is your multisig? So we, we've just seen from, the, uh, from recent hacks, three out of four multisig is not sufficient. And you know, keeping your keys in a MetaMask on your computer, which can be targeted by malware, is also not sufficient. So you have to think about not only what code you write, but how you will manage that code as well. Other things like insufficient function access control is an embarrassing issue to have in your protocol. That means your auditors or even you did not go through that threat modeling exercise. You do not know how exactly your protocol can be targeted and what exactly needs to be protected. So you have to be just really mindful of at least the top five here. Uh, the place where I really want to see all of these issues going is the bottom right corner where re-entrancy attacks are. They still happen. This is still a concern issue that should be mindful of. But luckily, at least so far this year, there were, uh, I guess, total nine issues combined between those two, and that's what we want to see versus 40-something in Price Oracle. It seems like every single week I, when I observe a hack, Price Oracle manipulation, it's, a, it's, a, it's not something we want to be. So what is the issue? So is, are we, do we not have enough auditors? Are auditors not experienced to find those issues? Um, there are quite a few companies out there. If we talked about a year ago, uh, there were maybe a dozen uh, uh, folks out there that you, know, you could not book an appointment with them. They were booked a year ahead. Now it feels like there are more and more uh, entities which are coming online that make their services available. And then even more are available as single auditors who are performing those services as well. We have plenty of bug bounty programs. We have competitive bounty uh, uh, programs like Code for Arena. Tools, Sertora and Foundry. It feels like the industry is getting more and more mature. Um, trading is interesting because I think this is more of an indicator of what's, what's, what is breaking here is that the training is very much focused on offense. So we, we got really good at teaching our auditors how to break things, but what about teaching developers on how to write really secure, uh, resistant code? And I think there are a few exceptions. I think if you looked at Patrick Collins' uh, YouTube channel, like he is very focused on uh, writing unit tests, like how to write defensible code. But for the most part, we're overly focused on offense. So just some takeaways for, the, uh, for code security. Uh, one, I feel that developers are, they do not have tools, they don't have sufficiently mature secure development process and tooling available to them. We have to provide standards, provide uh, guidance on how to build code securely. Um, defensive training is lacking. I think if you're, if you're thinking of a class and you want to build something, let's, let's focus less on auditors and more on developers so they start building code from this get-go. Uh, operational security, let's, let's teach our uh, developers on how to be safe, how to not use multi-sig, which is too small or is stored insecurely. And at last, when we grow the next generation of auditors, that list that I gave you, we really should be updating it, uh, the list of primary attack vectors. Let's, let's make sure that they're aware of it. Let's make sure that they understand what are the ways that protocols get attacked and not just simply run automated tools. Um, with that, as Eugene mentioned, it's not enough just to do safe code audits. We also have to think of what, what happens when everything goes wrong. And that's where incident response process goes. So first, how many are you familiar with the kill chain concept? Okay, so 
not as many folks. So this is, as, a, as an incident responder, the same way that you're building a threat model for what can go wrong with your protocol, this is the model that you use to build what attackers can do and what stages to target your protocol. So this is an example um, kill chain for majority of DeFi protocols out there. The way that it starts it is with the reconnaissance stage. So this is usually when attackers deploy test transactions. So we see with Nomad Compromise, they were like messing with on live on-chain. That's rare, but it happens. Uh, public discussion vulnerabilities. So Mango, Mango Markets attacker, like he was actively talking about it in the, one of the Discord chats. Uh, resource development. That's usually when the initial funding of the attack is happening, when you may be getting some flash loans just to set up the infrastructure for your attack. Uh, preparation usually involves helper contracts where they either deploy it, they configure them to target your protocol, uh, and of course, the active exploitation stage. Um, things don't end there. There's also the laundering part. That, that's what happens after the uh, protocol is attacked. The way that this is useful is that if you can disrupt the attacker at any one of those stages, you win. Even if you cannot stop the attacker at the very beginning in the preparation or resource development stages, but you catch them in the middle of the exploitation, you can at least minimize how much money was stolen from your protocol. Let's see a, a sample uh, uh, attack uh, that happened and how it applies to this threat model. So Euler attacker, there's a lot happening to this and more and more revealed, it feels like, every week. Um, on the reconnaissance stage, we don't know what they did. It sounds like they probably set up Foundry and they were doing everything offline, so there's no way you can catch them if they were emulating the attack locally on their machines. On resource development, we saw the funding, so as usual it seems, from Tornado Cache, followed by exploit deployment, so that's your preparation stage. And then the attack itself. The attack itself lasted for, uh, what is it, 15 minutes. And then at last they were starting to swap assets from USDC to other things. And the reason, the reason why they do that is because assets like USDC and Tether, they can be frozen. So most, most attackers, they tend to quickly swap them so they're not frozen on them. At any of those stages, Euler could have come in and stopped the attack. And notice, those stages lasted for minutes, so you really had to be fast. Like, if you want to learn more about like, what to do post-exploitation, I invite you to actually look at the talk by my colleague, uh, Heidi Wilder, tomorrow, called Rec Build. But we will focus on just the beginning stages. So let's, let's look at the timing here. So we, we can start with the compromise stage. This is when the uh, attack actually occurred. Detection, that's when someone usually someone else, notices that there's an attack in progress. Finally, the end of the triage process, that's when the, uh, the protocol usually determines, okay, this is an incident, we need to respond to it. And the way that I determine the uh, triage uh, time point is when they usually publish something. So they say, okay, we have, we have an issue. Okay, so on Euler's side, it took about nine minutes for an external party, nine minutes for PeckShield to put a tweet out there that we have, we have a problem. And then another two hours for them to respond to say, okay, we are investigating this, this is a concern. Other protocols like multi-chain took an hour for someone else to find it and another four hours for them to respond. Bonk, similar seven minutes to hour and a half. Your notice it's negative 17 minutes. Someone was actually able to catch that there's a uh, an exploit contract that was deployed before it was used in the attack. That's, that's where we want to be. But it still took them another hour and a half to respond, so the money was lost. And the abysmal response by Poly Network, uh, six hours to detection, and then five hours to respond. Notice in every single one of those cases, these are the top five largest hacks so far this year. In every single case, someone else had to go and knock on their door and say, hey, you have an issue. Not a single point did the protocol itself have sufficient monitoring to say, like, we have a problem and we're going to respond. What is an issue? Do we not have enough monitoring solutions? It feels like more and more companies are spinning up out there. The issue is that we're dealing with a lot of noise. The signal-to-noise ratio is not good. We can't go back and find, like, yes, we know there's an exploit, and yes, our protocol did catch it, but can you tell that to me 17 minutes before the exploit actually happened? That's what we need to push for. 
Forensics uh, teams are too focused on traditional tracking of assets as opposed to doing the full analysis that we're used to in traditional security, reversing the smart contracts, analyzing how the exploit works. And then the incident response is once again, we're relying on volunteers. We have people like Sam basically called in into war rooms. Who are you going to call to really help you with the protocol? I feel like there's a gap there. So takeaway here is incident response detection by Twitter is not gonna work. That's a problem. Lacking incident response process, if you don't know exactly what you're gonna do every single minute, you're wasting that time and every minute wasted is the time that you can lose millions. We need to move not only because of how quickly those attacks are happening, we need to move from detection to automatic intrusion prevention. You don't have time to review all those things. You need to pull, pull the plug early on automatically. So at this point you might say, I can't trust my smart contracts, I can't trust my wallets, I can't trust anything, definitely not myself, not to lose everything. Let's go back to trading shells. And to that, I want to tell you, don't worry, this is the issue here is that we're trying to compress the time that it took decades for traditional security to build up the expertise and tools, and we're trying to compress this time in just a few years, and it's painful. So the, what I would suggest is that really rely on the community. We have an amazing community. Every single one of you here is amazing at sharing knowledge. We have capture the flag competitions where you can learn. We have conferences such as the one we have here. We did not have conferences for a couple years back, there was nothing. And of course, we have newsletters, shameless plug, subscribe to Block Threat, Rekt, and others to just keep up on what are the latest events. And when it gets hard, I just want to make you, just remind you, why are we doing this? Why are we doing our jobs? Why are we waking up every morning? We're trying to build trust in the ecosystem. And that's a, a critical step to adoption, a critical step to letting all these people to use our protocol safely, freely, without anyone telling them, no, you cannot use this. So every single one of you in this room has the power to increase trust in the ecosystem. And in that affect millions and billions of lives. And with that, any questions? There's been a lot of talk about account abstraction. And I'm just curious, how heavily does account abstraction feature more specifically in the role of stolen private keys? Is it a continuous discussion? Is it a side discussion? Is it something that the security industry is really taking notice of or incorporating? I think it's amazing. I mean, we're, we're dealing, like if you remember the threat model, $200 million lost. Can we use this new tech to make things better? Can we introduce additional checks and balances, maybe some kind of recovery mechanisms? I think there's an opportunity to, uh, to make things safer but it's too early to tell. I feel like we're still at the standardization stage and adoption stage. We'll see how it plays out. I, I'm optimistic that it will be useful for uh, many other reasons too. Uh, one more question. Um, given that the state of malware has a bunch of techniques for say like self encrypt or self decrypting binaries to avoid AV detection, like prevention seems somewhat infeasible until like cryptographic keys or cryptographic information is sent to the contract. So to what extent do you think prevention is actually feasible versus like attackers will just implement well-known countermeasures to bypass your prevention? Well, it's lucky we're not at that stage yet. I feel like we're still, the attackers did not, it's like, a, you know, the frog and the poison snake analogy where both need to constantly compete and get stronger and stronger. It's so easy to exploit the smart contracts right now. Attackers don't really need to obfuscate their smart contracts just yet. Please don't listen to this talk. Um, they, they don't need to evolve just yet. We'll get there. But for now, we can still simulate transactions and we can catch like basic things like, oh, your, your pool just got uh, completely empty or your, your, your governance somehow is changing. So we can, we can do really basic things today that will catch an attack in progress. Uh, and when we need to evolve, we'll evolve, but I wouldn't say like, okay, we have to just give up, I guess. Once, once they evolve, we'll need to do that as well, but at least we need to catch the bare minimum today, which we don't. Maybe our last question. Okay, cool. I think um, 
So it's time for the break.